Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay without that? Yeah. You can. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for taking the time and letting like me speak here for a few minutes tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a state senator. I represent parts of uh, Montgomery County and Delaware County. I was first elected to the House in 2002 and the Senate in 2008. Uh, by way of background, I was born in Northeast Philadelphia. Um, I never met my dad. It was a single mom uh, situation. My mother, uh, you know, and I lived together. And eventually, my grandmother got sick, moved in with us, and my, there was no program to take care of my grandmother. So my mother had a better job uh, to take care of her. Uh, and so we actually had to go on public assistance, which was called welfare. And, and eventually, my mother said that she could no longer afford to take care of me. And so what that meant is that I went to a series of foster homes. I wound up going to eight elementary schools. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, when you're a kid, you don't really think about things as good or bad or weird, it's just the way they are. Uh, but I think that these experiences, because the foster homes were not particularly nice places, uh, they did a couple of things for me that were actually kind of useful as an adult. First of all, I think it made me really progressive. Uh, I saw firsthand how sometimes people need help uh, through no fault of their own. And I also saw the benefit of investing in people. Uh, by the community, uh, you know, whether it was school lunches or the, the literally the Medicaid that I used for healthcare, um, whether later it was uh, student loans and Pell grants and other things that my community provided for me that enabled me to overcome what were sort of initially difficult circumstances, uh, go to college, go to law school, uh, and have a whole new life. Um, but I like to think that I never sort of forgot where I came from. The other thing I would say is. It sort of made me a little bit fearless because I went through a few experiences that made the prospect of losing an election seem almost quaint. Uh, and, and you know, I've never really had that fear. Um, and if you don't have the fear of losing an election as a politician, it's a tremendous gift. It is incredibly liberating. You can actually do things, you know, and not worry about, oh my God, do I have to, you know, please this person or hide this view or whatever it is. And so, when I was elected to the House, and I was in the, okay. and I was in the position to you know, try to accomplish some things, I sat down with myself, talked to myself quite a bit. Um, I try not to do it like, visually you know, anymore, because people stare. But anyway, so I talked to myself and I said, you know, what do I want to do with this opportunity? And I decided that I was just going to do what I thought was right, um, regardless of the consequences. And, what that did was it gave me the opportunity to get involved in a number of very controversial issues. A lot of my colleagues are afraid of controversy, uh, and uh, I have a weird genetic mutation where I think that's the fun of the job. Um, if I don't get a lot of hate mail in a given week, I feel like I'm slacking. So, uh, and we do get a lot. We keep a wall of the best ones, because some people are very creative. Um, so in any event, uh, I got involved in a bunch of issues that were uh, for some people difficult. Uh, I introduced the only marriage equality bill in Pennsylvania history. I did that in 2009, but well before it was cool to do that. Uh, when I introduced my medical marijuana bill, everyone said it was crazy, I couldn't get a co-sponsor. However, I eventually found a Republican colleague to work with across the aisle, uh, and we worked very hard, and we did something that almost never happens in Harrisburg. We changed minds. And we passed that bill, uh, and overwhelmingly, Finally, when it came to the floor after a lot of struggle, uh, and the governor signed the law, and we will soon have not only um, a, an industry that's going to provide a lot of uh, amelioration of suffering and save a lot of lives, particularly with the opioid crisis, but it's going to be a major new industry in Pennsylvania. Tens of thousands of jobs, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, into the camp into the um, campaign. I guess nothing better uh, into the taxpayer uh, into the treasury. So um, this is a huge I feel like if I do nothing else for the rest of my career, at least I can point to that as one thing that really, I think, made a difference. Um, criminal justice reform. I know when I started here, because we have a mass incarceration system that costs too much money, destroys too much lives, too many lives, and doesn't keep us safe. And so I started taking that on, fighting mandatory minimum sentences, and introducing legislation abolishing the death penalty, which, whatever you feel about it morally, is costing us hundreds of millions of dollars a year to have, and we haven't actually executed someone who did not ask to be 
be executed since 1962. Okay, that's uh, 55 years ago. So this is not a lot of bang for the buck in terms of money, no matter what you think of the morality of the death penalty. Um, and I can talk, you know, I have a bill to eliminate bail, I mean pretrial detention for failure to make bail, etc. And so there are a lot of things that uh, I took on which were difficult to take on, and we won many of those battles. And we're still fighting some of them, but I feel like we made a lot of progress. I was initially a little reluctant to run this this year. I thought it was, uh, you know, my daughter is 16, she just got a little brag, she just got a gig, she'll be a U.S. Senate page for the next four and a half months living in Washington. I'm a little freaked out, but it'll be fine. Um, she had a little viral moment, I don't remember, she asked Hillary a question about body shame at, uh, at a hill at a town hall and it became this huge thing and the Trump people went crazy. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, she's looking at colleges, my son needs to teach me around, and, uh, you know, we're doing important things in the Senate, but I think that we have reached a point where we have several, I only have a couple minutes, but existential crises facing America. We have an economic crisis. Income inequality is the highest it's been in 100 years. People can't afford to go to college, put away money for retirement. Minimum wage has gone up in 11 years. The tip minimum wage for people who theoretically get tips hasn't gone up in almost a quarter of a century. It's $2.13 an hour. I support single payer Medicare for all. Um, and uh, there's a few things that we can do that would make a huge difference in the lives of so many American uh, citizens um, that I think are really important. So we have a political crisis, we have uh, an economic, we have a political crisis. Um, Jane mentioned uh, gerrymandering. We also have voter suppression. Uh, we also have campaign finance. We have a lot of things that are making our election sort of a joke. We have climate change, which is another existential crisis. I don't know if saw Al Gore's new movie, but it's really compelling. But there are a few things we need to do, uh, particularly there's a, a great conservative idea, which is a, a carbon tax, and the money goes in. But let's say the government doesn't keep it, because let's say we, we want to pass something, we want to compromise. Just write checks to the citizens uh, for, you know, when they said Sarah Palin was the most popular governor in America when she ran, because she did that and send each of everyone in Alaska 4,000 bucks every year. It's easy to be popular if you could do that. Um, and so, and, and, but that would have the impact of lowering the amount of carbon we put into the atmosphere. Uh, and finally, I've been very aggressive in taking on Donald Trump. And I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because, <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I think that we, he is not like Mitt Romney or Tom Kane or other Republicans who I did not vote for and who I have been happy about as president for their policies, but they were honorable people who would have done an incredible job as president. But Donald Trump, temperamentally, intellectually, uh, in so many ways, psychologically, is just not fit to be president. He is an existential threat to so many things that we hold dear, a free press, an independent judiciary. I mean, I spoke at a, not at, I spoke at a, my first anti-Nazi rally the other night in Ardmore. I mean, that was a sentence I've now said out loud. Like, you know, like I never thought I'd have to do that in America. All right, and this is a guy who's embracing white supremacism, uh, endorsed police brutality, uh, you know, destroying the EPA. I mean, part of the problem is all his crazy tweets uh, are covering up really bad policies that don't get enough attention in the press because they're not as sexy as the police and the stuff like that. But he's destroying the EPA. He's destroying the Justice Department. He's destroying the Department of Housing and, and, and the, the, the dead person there and the Department of Energy and so much else that is precious to us and really important to America continuing it as it is. I think we have to talk about that because anyone who is silent, my Republican opponent in the fall, next fall, Pat Meehan, who's an affable guy, but uh, he has been utterly silent on everything. And uh, that is not acceptable. If you are silent, you are complicit when American values are at risk. And so I will not be silent, I promise you that. Um, uh, we, we, you know, we are working very hard, we pulled the district, we're looking really good, uh, but you know, there's no reason to be a Republican incumbent, so, uh, you know, they all, they all have tons of money, I'm sure they'll say very charming things about me, but at the end of the day, I think what people really want is authenticity and passion and a vision and being engaged, and I, I, I think 